All right, I'm going to kick off then. Um, brilliant to see so many of you here. Thank you very much for coming down here into the dingy basement to uh, see this session. Um, my name is Steve Sanderson. I work for Microsoft. I'm on the ASP.NET team, as you can see from my slide. And what we're going to talk about today is this thing called single page applications. And that is not a new term that I've just invented. This is pretty much an industry standard term. It's uh, a movement that we're seeing across a lot of different web technologies towards this single page, page architecture. But it is still a relatively new thing. So how many of you have built anything yet that you would call a single page application? Ooh, that's a decent number. OK, so that's maybe 5%, maybe. 7% or something? OK, so um, for a lot of you, this is a, a lot of new concepts. And for those of you that have built it, you'll be able to relate to some of the difficult aspects of this and some of the opportunities for making it a whole lot nicer. So that's what I'll hopefully be able to show you now. So let me just start with a quick definition. So what is this SPAR thing, single page applications? Well, it's an architecture for web applications. And when I say combining the best of web and desktop, what I mean by that is that web applications are really great, as we all know, in that you don't have to install them, they appear in your browser, they, uh, they don't run any untrusted code, and they can work on any device that's got a browser, and you can link to them, you can bookmark them, you can do back and forwards, you know, really easy to, um, to use. Desktop applications are also really good because they are very responsive. You can navigate around inside them without talking to any kind of server, and they're available offline, of course. So what if we could get the best of both of those things by coming up with an architecture that gives us uh, all of those benefits? OK, so I'll be talking about that architecture in a minute or so. Critically, though, we don't want to introduce anything new, fancy new browser plugins or anything like that. This is just going to be standard web technologies that are going to work on any device, operating system, whatever. OK, so let's start with a couple of real world examples to further motivate this. So this. Hipmunk is my favorite website for finding flights. You put in your uh, details of when you want to go and where you want to go, and it comes back with this attractive list of all the flights you can choose from, and then you can sort them, filter them, change your criteria, that sort of thing, and it responds instantly because it doesn't have to the talk to the server at that point. It changes the UI just on the client because it's just got the raw data from the server. And then if you want to navigate around through your previous selections, you can go backwards and forwards, and again, it's instant. It doesn't have to talk to the server at all to do that. And if you take a very close look at the URL, you'll see that hash symbol in there. And that's one of the ways you can do client-side navigation. And we'll be looking at how you can do that on ASP.NET in a few minutes. OK, another real-world example, just to prove that I'm not completely Microsoft-centric in this talk. Here is the Google app, which is running on an iPad. And it looks like a native app in that you get it from the App Store. And it installs on your home screen, like all the other apps. And when you launch it up, it, again, looks and feels like a native app. And so for any normal user that's not people in this room, you know, normal human beings, when they use it, they will think it's just like all the other apps. But if you look into it, it's actually built with web technologies. So that's all HTML and JavaScript running that. And uh, also, to some extent, it works offline. So they've done a good job at that. And we'll be looking at how we can build something like that. OK. so. Just to clarify what the benefits of this are and why you might want to consider this for your next project for clear benefits as compared with other web application architectures. So what I mean by great user experience there is basically speed. So um, when it comes to changing the display of the user interface or navigating around, we want an instant response. We want it to be like a native app, so we're not talking to the server to do that. Uh, of course, it's just built with native web technologies, so uh, it's going to run on any, any device. And uh, at least back to IE6, we'll be targeting with the kind of architecture we're looking at here. And of course, anything newer than that. And working offline, well, that's an interesting thing for web applications, which is uh, just becoming possible now. And when you do single page application architecture, it's actually surprisingly straightforward. So I'll be able to demo that to you. And then this last thing about deploying into app stores, well, that's a bit advanced. I'm not going to be covering that in this talk. But just so you know, in case it's important to your business that you want to go into the Windows Marketplace, the Apple App Store, and whatever Google calls their one, then you can do that using something like the um, third-party tool PhoneGap. allows you to package a single-page application and uh, put it onto those app stores. But I'm not, demo, not going to demo that. I'm just going to focus on those first three benefits. OK. So last slide before I start doing some demos. I will not bore you with slides, I promise. So. Um, 
Before we get into some code, let's just have a quick box arrow, box arrow cylinder diagram so we all know, you know roughly what shape this thing is. So on the server, this is web technology. So as everybody knows, you're going to have some kind of endpoint that serves HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And then on the browser, that's going to end up being rendered uh, as the visible user interface, and you'll have your own JavaScript running in there. OK, that's just standard web application architecture. Nothing new. Everybody knows that. So what's different? Well, with single page applications, we tend to also have data endpoints on the server. So some URL that you can hit, and it's just going to return JSON or XML data for your application. And so what you're going to do with that? Well, you're going to have some data access code on the browser, which is going to fetch that data and render some user interface based on that. OK. So after we've done that, we also want to uh, do very fast navigation in the browser. And there are a bunch of different APIs that uh, recent and even older browsers support that allow you to do things like bookmarking and back forward navigation without talking to the server to fetch new pages. So we'll be uh, wanting to use some of that. And when we've done all that, we can kind of break that link on the top left there with the uh, HTML and CSS endpoints. Once our application has been bootstrapped and is in the browser, it's just running there, and it can talk to the server to get data, and it can update its user interface, and it can navigate around, and it doesn't have to fetch more pages from the web. So that's going to make it fast. And then an interesting thing happens, which is that all that stuff on the right-hand side there can be made available offline. And we'll look at how we can do that. And then further interesting thing is that if we want to be able to do things like data editing while the server is not accessible, we can use some new APIs like the local storage API in HTML5 so that we don't even depend on the data services being accessible. If they're not accessible, then we can persist our changes locally and synchronize them back with the server when it becomes available. So we can support these kind of occasionally connected scenarios. And that's what uh, we'll be uh, building up to in this demo. So, I'm actually going to give you two main demos in this talk. The first one's really short. It'll take five minutes. And the next demo is the big meaty one that will take all the rest of the time. So let's get started and uh, see how we can start building something like this on top of ASP.NET MVC. So if you've been any, in any of Scott Goo's talks so far in this conference, you may have heard that we're releasing the ASP.NET MVC for beta this week, possibly even today when the people in America wake up. I don't know. We'll see if they're feeling like it this morning when they get up. But hopefully, it will happen today. And uh, when you install that, you will have a new project template for single page applications and some new scaffolding tooling that will help you build something with the architecture I just described. So I'm just going to show you how that works right now so you'll know what to expect. But then after I've shown you this little demo, I'm going to forget about all the helpful tooling. And we're going to dig di deep into the underlying technologies so that you'll really know how it works. So I'll create a new project, and I'm creating a, an MVC4 web application. And I'll give it the delightful name of MVC Application 3. Um, then on this list of project templates, you'll see we've now got single page application as an option there. So I'll press the wrong button, and then I'll have to press OK again. And now I'll choose single page application. OK, so that's going to create my application for me. And what's going to pop out of there is basically the same as a normal MVC4 application. The only difference is that uh, we have got uh, a few extra JavaScript libraries that are going to uh, make it easier for us to build single page applications. And also, you'll be able to see that we've given this sample class when it finishes creating it. We've also got this sample model class that you can use if you want to scaffold a quick user interface up. So if you're an advanced user, you won't do this. But if you're just getting started, you'll look at your models folder, and you'll see this to-do item class. And that's what appears by default. And it gives you these instructions. And basically, what it says is, if you want to see an example of how to build a single page application, why don't you right click on your controllers folder and go to Add Controller. And then on the dialog that appears there, you see that we've got another new option at the bottom there, single page application. All right, so let's choose that. So choose the single page application. Let's give it a name. I'll call it tasks controller because it's working with to-do items. And for my model class, I'll choose to-do item. And data context is the thing that you know stores the data in a database. Don't have one yet. I'll just let the tooling create one for me. Give it the default name. It's not really interesting. OK, so hit add. And that's going to go off, and it's going to create an initial application structure for me following that architecture that I just described a minute ago. Now, we're not saying that this is a finished application that you're going to uh, deploy onto your web server and you know, get paid big money by your clients for doing that. 
Um, but it will hopefully give you an idea of how you're going to get started with this. And after I've shown you this, we'll pretty much ignore everything that the scaffolding does and build it step by step ourselves so that you can really see what all the underlying technologies are. OK, so it's doing its thing there. And it's created all these files for me. And I'm not going to dig too much into this code because, as I said, I, I'm just showing you what you're going to get out of the box here before we get into detail. So let me just run the application, and I'll show you what pops up in my web browser. And so initially, it's going to take me to my normal site homepage. And, and that's just going to look like a normal MVC4 application homepage that comes out of the box. No, I don't think I'll activate Windows now. It's not the best time. Um, so we've got uh, our project homepage. It looks a bit more colorful than MVC3, but nothing really different there. Now, remember, I scaffolded a controller called Tasks Controller. So I'm going to visit that, type in slash tasks there. And the first time it runs, it has to create my database behind the scenes. So it's going to take a few seconds to do that. And when it pops up, you'll see that we've now got our uh, to-do items uh, editing screen. So now I can do things like I can create a to-do item, Walk the dog. OK, that's done. And then I'll create another thing. Let's say I'll take over the world. OK. And now I can go back into one of these things, like walk the dog. I can mark that as done. I can undo my change. I could redo it. I can save it. And I can do things like hit the back button to go back to where I was and the forward button. And you're probably thinking, so what? That's like any other application that anyone has ever built. Yes, but what's different here is that this is a single page application. So as I'm doing the navigation around like this, it's not going to the server to get the new user interface. It's rendering it on the client, which means that it's going to be very much more fast, very much faster, as people who speak English say, than uh, a typical web application. So I don't want to focus too much on the scaffolding there because you know we're all we're advanced enough people who come to conferences, and we've got the next hour, so we can dig into the underlying technologies there and see what the components are, how you can use them, and how you could replace them with other components if you don't like it. So let's jump back to our box arrow diagram, and uh, let's think about the technologies that are in play here. So for each one of those white boxes, there's got to be some kind of technology to implement that. So what is it going to be? For the web UI, up in the top corner, you can use any of our web UI technologies, MVC, web forms, web matrix, whatever you like. And for this demo, I'm going to be using MVC, and that's what our project template uses as well. So that's a good option, but you can use the others if you will. And for data services, well, what you may have also heard from other talks in this conference so far is that as part of MVC4, we're uh, bringing in this web API technology, which is a very powerful way of exposing data services from your MVC application in a nice restful kind of way. So that's really a nice piece of technology, and I'll be showing you some cool things about that in a minute. OK, moving on to the right-hand side. Down at the bottom, what are we going to do for local storage? Well, we don't really have to do anything there, because that's something that's just built into your web browser. HTML5 provides that natively. And for older browsers, there are kind of fallback JavaScript libraries. Don't have to worry about that. The data access layer, that's an interesting one, because we're bringing in a new library here, a JavaScript library called Upshot.js, which is a powerful data access library that knows how to talk to various different types of server-side endpoints particularly Web API. So it knows how to interpret the data from your server, understanding the .NET metadata for things like validation and associations. It knows how to track changes that you might make to the data and to synchronize those changes back to the server in multiple different ways. Um, it also supports things like querying that can, can run queries against the server, or it can run queries against its local cache of data if you ask it to. So it's a very powerful and flexible way of accessing data. And once you've gone that, of course, you're going to build some user interface on top of that. So what are, what are you going to use to build your user interface in the browser? Well, your application layer in JavaScript and your visible UI bit in HTML, you're going to write that. So there's no library there. It's your JavaScript and your HTML. But there has to be something to kind of bind these things together and keep them in sync. And you could do that with lots of different technologies. But one that we're recommending as part of this project template and general guidance is an MVVM, Model View View Model, library for JavaScript called Knockout.js, which is something I've been involved in creating. It's a, an open source uh, community project. And that gives you a very powerful way of doing declarative coding to uh, set up a user interface uh, that you know, reflects your underlying JavaScript data. OK, and then finally, in terms of the navigation APIs, well, there are loads of JavaScript libraries that deal with uh, client-side navigation. 
The one that we're picking out and recommending, although it's up to you if you want to choose a different one, is History.js. The reason we've chosen that is because, as far as we can tell, it's the best, in the sense that it has the best cross-browser support. It works really well, even with old browsers, even with IE6, it's going to work robustly and uh, fixes a whole load of different browser bugs, so you don't have to worry about them. But if you don't want to use it, you can use a different one. OK. So, taking all of this, let's try and build an interesting, realistic application. So, I'm going to uh, start by, um, well, I'll show you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you on a little tour through these four areas. We'll start by building some uh, data services, then we'll build a user interface on top of it, then we'll think about how we can make it into a mobile app and do some client-side navigation, and finally, we'll enter the bizarro world of offline web applications, uh, which is where you can really see some of the value of this. So, let's get started with the data piece up in the top left there. I'm about to break into some proper coding now, but before I do that, let me just quickly recap this architecture in case any of you missed it the first time around. So, the data piece of the architecture is, on the server, we are using Web API to expose your model data. And to, to give you further details, inside there, we've got a standard base class called DB Data Controller. And if you create a DB data controller, then that gives you a quick and easy way of exposing your data. You just point that to some underlying entity framework data store, and it pretty much does the rest. It knows how to expose that in a restful way. It knows how to receive change sets from the client and to apply those change sets to apply validation and to return metadata, all the kind of stuff that's boring to implement. It's, it's going to deal with that. And then over on the client, to access that data, as I said, we've got this Upshot.js library. And the main API inside Upshot is a thing called a data source. So you instantiate a data source, and it knows how to talk to the server. One of the things it knows how to talk to is Web API. So it's going to integrate well with that, and it tracks the changes, synchronizes them back, whatever. And of course, then you can build your application code on top of that. So let's have a go at actually doing this, shall we? Jump back into my demo machine. And as I said, I'm not really interested in this to-do items thing anymore, so I'm just going to get rid of all of this. And, and Instead, I will show you this other project that I've hopefully got loaded. Um, here we go. OK, so uh, this project is called Delivery Tracker. And the premise for my application is that I'm a company that does deliveries. I don't, we deliver something. People go out in vans. They deliver stuff. And we want to be able to tell each delivery driver what they need to deliver today. And then they need to take that information out onto the road with them on a phone or a tablet or something. And then each time they make a delivery, they need to be able to check a box to say, I delivered that now. And then that information should synchronize back to the server, assuming we can reach the server. And if we can't, we'll have to deal with that in some way. And then we'll know what stuff's been delivered. So the main bit of model data I'll be working with is a delivery. So my delivery model class has got a uni unique ID, it's got a description, and we've got a flag to say whether it's been delivered or not yet. So very basic, uh, just for the sake of this demo, we'll just keep it down to those fields. And so that I can show you a one-to-many relation, we've also got a customer class there, and you can see that each delivery belongs to a particular customer. So each delivery has got a customer ID. Okay? And then in order to actually store these in a database, I've got a DB context class. And if you know Entity Framework Code first, you'll know that that's those two lines of code here are all you have to do to actually map that data into a relational database and deal with uh, loading and saving there. So I've got that, and I want to create my application. But I don't want to use any scaffolding. I want to build it by hand so that you can really see how it works. So let's start by creating a Web API data service. Okay? So as I said, uh, we want to create a DB data controller. So I'm going to right-click on my controllers and say Add Controller. And then when that pops up, I'm going to... Let me zoom in, because I know you guys, you can't really see that easily. So I'm going to call it... Let's call it Data Services Controller. Data Service Controller. OK. And what template shall I use? Well, empty, because I don't really want to rely on scaffolding too much. So I will add that and zoom back out a bit. And then I've got my data service controller. It's just created for me. Right, let's get rid of the stuff that appears in there by default. Strip it down a bit. And I'll change the base class to DB data controller. Data controller. OK. And also, I need to tell it where to load and save the data. So I need to point it to my underlying entity framework data context. And that is called app DB context, as you saw a minute ago. So this is a DB data controller over my app DB con context and import the namespaces, and that's almost ready to go now. That's almost ready to start serving my data. But there are two things that are missing. Firstly, I haven't created any actual endpoints that you can fetch data from, so it doesn't know what shape to return the data in. 
So I want to actually tell it you know, which bits of the data to return. So I'm going to create a public method on there. I'll call it get deliveries for today. And if I was letting my delivery drivers log in, then they would log in and we would filter this with a where click query here so that we only return the deliveries for today and for that driver. But you know, we've only got an hour to go through this, so let's just return all the data. Okay? And I'm returning it as a queryable, and that allows the client, Upshot in this case, to run arbitrary queries against that. Not completely arbitrary, but specific ones like um, sorting, paging, filtering, and uh, passing custom parameters into the method. OK, so that's enough to give a read-only view of my data. But I actually want it to be read-write, because I want people to be able to change uh, the delivery status. And in order to make your data read-write, you have to opt into that for security reasons. And the way you opt into it is by creating these methods. So you have an insert, an update, and a delete method, or just one of them, or two of them, or whatever subset is useful for you. And then you can put your custom logic into the method to control things like who can change the data and in what way can they change it. But again, we've only got an hour, and the focus of this talk is not on data. So I'm just going to say anybody can make any change to the data that they want. So that's the kind of behavior I've implemented here. And that would be fine if I trust everyone who's working for my system. But you might want to put in more detailed access control rules. OK, so I'll compile, compile that. And let's see if this is actually working, shall we? So I'll go over into a browser. Let's pop that open. And I will try to run some queries directly. OK, so this should come to my uh, home page. OK, and then what's the URL for that thing that I just created there? Well, by convention, uh, web API URLs start with API. You can change that if you want to, but that's just the default convention. And then we've got the name of the, well, you can see in the autocomplete. So we've got the name of the uh, service on the server, and then I've got the name of the endpoint. Just the default routing configuration there, which you can change if you want to. So uh, if I make a request to that, then what should come back is the data from my database. And indeed, it's coming back in XML format. Because I didn't ask for any particular format, if I had asked for it in a JSON format, it would have come back in that format. Uh, but I didn't, and this is just the default. OK, so that's looking all right. Uh, one thing to notice is that although each row has a customer ID, it's not returning the actual customer data for each entity there. If I want that customer data, I can do that pretty straightforwardly, because I can use standard entity framework type code like this to say that for each of the deliveries, I want to include the customer data for that item. So enter that, rebuild, switch back, and reload. And hopefully now, we'll get the customer data as well. And we do. You can see that for each item there, I've got the customer data. OK, that's, that's good. And I could start running arbitrary, well, not arbitrary. I can run a specific set of queries against that, specifically the uh, OData queries. So I can run sort page filter queries uh, just by entering special URLs, like this URL, if you can read the small text. Let's zoom in. Uh, that's going to filter to just return the customer IDs, the rows for which customer ID equals one. So if I run, zoom back out, you'll see I've only got a small number of rows. And if I change that one to a two, I'll get a different set of rows. So you can run OData queries against that if you want to. But I don't really want to, because what I actually want to do is build a proper user interface. So I don't want to be typing queries into my address bar. I want to write some JavaScript code that does the queries against that data service. So let's go back to the home page. And let's think about building uh, an actual user interface there. Let's say I just want to start by getting a list of all the deliveries that I can from my server. And that will get me started with the client-side UI rendering. So in that view that you just saw rendered there, that's this view here, I want to tell Upshot how to reach the server. Now, we have to give it some type of configuration information, because otherwise it's no idea what the endpoints on the server are. And the easiest way to give it that configuration information is to use this helper. So html.upshot context. And you can see that I'm doing all of this with IntelliSense, so it's fairly straightforward to figure out uh, what configuration I can do. And then I can set up a data source. Remember I said that we were working with data sources on the client? And to do a data source, you have to point it to the controller that it's going to read and write data to. So I'll point it to my data, what's it called, data service controller. Okay, And then I also need to point it to a specific endpoint. And I will point it to the get deliveries for today method. Okay, So that is all we need to do to configure the client side code. Then to actually get it to do a query, well, I'm just going to drop in a bit of JavaScript I've already prepared. So um, what I'm doing here is I'm opening 
opening up a function context, and then I'm grabbing this data source. I'm saying, OK, Upshot, among your collection of data sources, you know that there's something called deliveries for today. And you know that because I configured it up here. So I'd like to have a reference to that thing, please. And then I'm going to ask Upshot to refresh the contents of that data source. So that's where it actually does the query to the server. And then the results, they come back asynchronously as a callback function. And I'm just alerting them to the screen, which is obviously a bit of a cheap trick. And I'll build a proper user interface in a minute. But let's see if that works, shall we? So in my browser, if I hit reload, then you can see, if I zoom in, that it has alerted all these objects. So it's got these 10 objects back from the server. It doesn't really know how to display them, so it just says object, object, object. But if you want proof that it's really fetched the data, let's have a look in the browser's network tab. If I go to the list of uh, AJAX requests, you'll see that the browser did call get deliveries for today, and the response shows that I got this data in JSON format, and if I look at this preview thing inside Chrome, you can see that the data really did come back from the server. Okay, so that's good. But I don't really want to do these little alert boxes. I actually want to build a real user interface. And there's plenty more that I want to show you about Upshot as well. But in order to show you more about Upshot, I'm going to have to have a user interface so that we can actually see what's going on. So let's think about how we're going to build this user interface, okay? We're building up this data model on the client, and we want to have some way of transforming it into a visible user interface. There are many different ways you could do that, but the pattern that we're recommending is this one called Model View View Model, MVVM. And those of you who have done any Silverlight or WPF development will very much likely have heard of it, if not actually done it. And the way this pattern works is that it splits up your application user interface into these three parts. Your model, which is the data that's coming from the server, and as you've just seen, that's being provided by Upshot. Your view, which is uh, in the form of HTML, because this is a web application, and that's, you know, the browser renders HTML. And then something in the middle which negotiates between these two and makes stuff work. Your view model, that's where you're going to put some application logic of your own. For example, when someone clicks on a button, what's the application going to do? Well, your logic goes into the view model there. OK, so what technologies are we going to use to accomplish this? Well, uh, what we're recommending, although again, you can swap it for something else if you prefer, is an MVVM library called Knockout.js. And the way this works, the main uh, piece of uh, API inside uh, Knockout is this thing called an observable. So what you might say is, let's say I've got a view model, and I'm letting people do searches. So I have a property on my view model called search text, representing the thing that the user is currently searching for. And if I make that as an observable, I can give it some initial value. And then I can bind that value to some visible part of my user interface. So I can use one of these data bind attributes that Knockout knows about. And here I'm saying that I want the value on this text box to be linked with the search text on my view model. And then when the screen is rendered, the user will see a text box that says, chickens, in it. And the important thing to understand is that this is a live binding. So if you change the data in your underlying view model, because it's observable, that will automatically refresh the corresponding parts of the screen. And similarly, if the user edits what's in the text box, that will also change what's in the view model. So most of your programming will just be against the view model, which is a nice, clean, object-oriented representation of the UI. And as you make changes in there, they will be synchronized with the server without you writing any code. And that will save you massive amounts of coding, actually. Um, hopefully, you'll get to see that as we get through this demo. So let's try and build a real user interface now based on this data. So let's say I want to start just by uh, rendering a list of the deliveries. So I want to do it in this MVVM style. So uh, I'm going to replace the JavaScript that I've already got there with something that's a bit more MVVM-ish. So what I'm doing here is defining a JavaScript function called deliveries view model. Now, if you know JavaScript, you'll know that any function can act as a class constructor. And that's what I'm doing here. So later on, I'm saying I want Knockout to apply bindings using a new instance of this deliveries view model thing, which is a class as in the JavaScript sense of the word. So inside here, my constructor, I can have private variables, which are just things that I don't expose from the constructor. And I can also have public variables, which are things that I do expose. So I'm having a self variable, which represents this object to keep track of what object this is, and then I can just add things to that in order to expose them. So I'm exposing a list of deliveries, and that is coming from the data source that Upshot manages that you've seen before, and I'm asking Upshot to give me the entities that are inside there. So now that's going to return to me the actual JavaScript array of the entities. 
Okay, and it's going to return it as an observable array. So if the contents of that array change because we refresh the data, then any user interface that's bound to that will also change. So things will always stay in sync. Okay, let's actually try and display that on the screen now, shall we? So I can do that with some fairly standard HTML markup. I'll have an ordered list element. And I will say I want to use a binding to say that for each of the deliveries, which are exposed from the view model, I want to have a list item element. And inside there, I'll display the text. And I'll put it on a strong element so it's nice and bold. And I want to bind the text on this element to the description property of the delivery. And if you're wondering where the description comes from, well, back in my domain model, you'll see that the delivery, the delivery has got a description. So that data has been mapped through Web API into the client-side code, and hopefully will get displayed. So let's try it, shall we? In my browser, I'll hit F5 to reload. And then you'll see it does render the, uh, the nice list of deliveries on the screen. Okay, Nothing amazing so far. But one thing that's kind of nice about this is because it's all declarative, I can make this user interface more sophisticated without really having to get into any sort of DOM manipulation code. So I can say this delivery is for, and I want to display the name of the customer, and I'll make it in italics with the emphasize element. And then I want to bind the text on this element to the customer property of the delivery. And that can change over time. It's observable. So we invoke it as a function to get the current customer for this delivery. And then I want to pick out the name property of that current customer. OK, so let's try that in my browser now. And then we can see that we've got the delivery description is for then the name of the customer in each case. OK, so we're getting the very basics of a user interface here. And, uh, and that's working OK. All right, so where should we go from here? Well, I want to show you some of the benefits of having this MVVM kind of separation. And the first one I want to show you is that because we've got a raw data model here, we can represent that data in multiple different ways uh, by rendering it on the client in different formats without having to go to the server multiple times. So let's say that uh, the delivery drivers don't really like to see the user interface presented like this because they really want to see it grouped by customer. They want to go to each customer and make all the deliveries to that customer, not go down the deliveries in the order that they were entered into the system. Makes sense, OK? So um, how are we going to show them by customer? Well, I can go into my view model, uh, and I can start adding some more code. But I'm a bit nervous about adding more code here right now, because this page is starting to get a bit complex. Look, I've got some server-side code. I've got some view. I've got some view model. It's starting to get a bit messy. So I want to do a little bit of quick refactoring before we proceed. I want to start by moving this deliveries view model out into a separate JavaScript class. So I'll create a new JavaScript file. I'll create a folder under scripts called app. This is just my personal convention. I like to have an app folder where I put the scripts related to the current application to differentiate them from the library scripts that come from third parties. OK, so I'm going to add into my app folder a new item, which will be a JavaScript class. If you can read the tiny text, you'll find that that is JavaScript file there. And I will call it deliveries view model. Apologies if you can't read the little text. OK, so inside that file, I want to put a view model class. Okay, so I'll put roughly the same class that I had before, um, just slightly different. Uh, let's not worry about that. But basically, again, it's a class constructor and it exposes a list of deliveries. Okay, so now I've got that class. I can hopefully use that instead of the class that I had before. So I'll just delete all that stuff and I'll replace it with a script reference. So my script reference here fetches in the deliveries view model. And so hopefully my application will just continue to work, and it's just slightly better factored now. So I'll just reload to check that it still works. And it does. Good. We're happy. Let's proceed. Right. So now I want to do a grouping by customer so that we can display a list by customer. Well, that's easy. I can say self.deliveries for customer equals, and then I'll grab that list of deliveries that we've already got, and then I'll ask Knockout to do a group by customer. Okay, so that's going to return to me an array in which each entry has a key, which is the customer that we've grouped by, and then a values, which is the array of all the deliveries for that customer. And importantly, this is another live piece of data. So if Upshot does another refresh and fetches some new data, then deliveries will change to reflect that, that contents. And then deliveries for customer will also change to reflect that, those contents without us writing any more code. And then any user interface that uses deliveries for customer will also change. So everything will stay in sync. OK, let's try it. I want to display my deliveries for customer. So I just need to create some more view markup that uses it. 
Well, I'm not going to type it all in because that would be boring. I'll just paste it in. So I'm going to have a heading that says customers. And then uh, this time I'm going to have an unordered list. And I'll say for each of those deliveries for customer, I'll have a list item. And the list item will display the name of the key. Now, we've grouped by customer. So key is the customer. So we'll display the customer's name there. And then the values will be the array of deliveries for that customer. So for each one of those, we'll display the description for that delivery. OK, not too difficult. Let's see that in the browser now. So I've still got my list at the top of deliveries. And now below that, I've also got my list of customers with each of the deliveries for that customer. So that's a lot easier for our delivery drivers to work with. And all the data is going to stay in sync. Now, I'd like to show you some really cool Upshot features now and related to data editing. So I want to make my data editable. And I think what I will do is I'll add checkboxes so the drivers can check a box to say they've made a delivery successfully. So I can do that without too much trouble. In my list of deliveries, I can just add a checkbox using standard HTML markup. Let's just reformat that so you can see it. So uh, we've got here uh, a label element that says delivered inside it. And then I've got a regular checkbox. And I'm using this binding to bind the check state of the checkbox to the is delivered property of the delivery. So hopefully, it will show whether or not the thing is delivered. And if we check the box, it will make it delivered or not delivered. Let's try it. So I hit reload. And you see these checkboxes all pop up. And some of them are checked. Some of them are not checked. And that shows us which ones are delivered. Um, but at the moment, it's really hard to see which ones are delivered, particularly when the text is quite small. You it's difficult to see the little check symbols. So what I really want to do is highlight the things that are delivered. I like to give them a nice big green highlight so we can see it more clearly. I can do that with another binding. Now, you've already seen me use a few bindings for each text, checked, and so on. I can also do a binding to affect the CSS styles on an element in a live kind of way. So I'm going to say for each of these delivery elements, I'm going to do a binding so that the element has a CSS class called delivered if and only if the current thing is delivered. OK? And so that will toggle this class on and off. And also, just to show everything stays in sync, I'm going to use the same CSS class on my other list of deliveries down at the bottom. So as well as displaying the description text, I'll also do a binding to this element to toggle the delivered class on that one as well. All right, let's try that. Back in the browser, hit reload. And now you'll see that some of them have got this nice green highlight on them. When they've been crossed out to say they've been done now. And to show you that everything stays in sync, see Nano Circuit Analyzer down there? That's not highlighted. If I check it up at the top, it becomes highlighted at the top and at the bottom because the checkbox changes the underlying data, which affects, you know, it flows out through all the different ways that data is reflected onto the screen. So everything is going to stay in sync. And I can check some more boxes and everything becomes green. Um, but it's not saving those changes yet. If I hit reload, everything's just going to go back to as it was before because I've not asked it to save my changes. Okay, I want it to save my changes. Well, I can do that in one of two different ways. I can tell Upshot, which is managing the underlying data, that I want it to synchronize the changes either only when I explicitly ask it to or implicitly all the time. At the moment, it's only saving them when I ask it to, but I can switch it into the other mode where it always saves changes immediately. So when my Upshot context is configured, I can use this option, buffer changes false. Say, so don't buffer the changes, just send them to the server as soon as they happen. Let's try that, shall we? So now I reload in my browser, and I'm going to mark a bunch of things as delivered. I'll mark all that top half of stuff delivered. And now when I hit the reload button, you'll see that they're still marked as delivered because it was saved in the database. To see how that works, let's uh, have a look at the browser's network tab again. So the list of HTTP requests. And we've got our initial AJAX request that fetches the list of deliveries. And now if I start checking boxes, you'll see each time I check a box, we get another one of these submit calls. So every time I make any change to my data, it's being immediately synchronized with the server. And that's a nice system if you don't want to have any save buttons on your dialog, because the user doesn't have to remember to click save. That's great for certain types of applications. But what if I do want the user to have an explicit save step? Well. I can switch it back then. So instead of buffer changes false, I'll change it to true, which, by the way, is default. So it's equivalent to not saying anything. But just to be explicit, I'll put that in. OK, so now it's going to buffer changes. So this time, we get the initial HTTP request. And now as I check boxes, you see there aren't any more requests. So I need to explicitly tell it to save stuff. So I'm going to need to have save button on my dialog. Oh, sorry, in my user interface. 
So I will add some uh, save and revert buttons to the screen. Regular HTML button element says save or revert. And I'm using another knockout binding to bind clicks on these things to functions on my view model. And it's nice having the functions on your view model because you can put custom application logic in there. Maybe it's not always allowed to save data. Maybe it is. It's up to you. You can put your custom logic in there. So I could put arbitrary logic to implement those save and revert methods, but my logic will actually be very simple. All I'm going to do, in fact, is say, when you click save all, I'll just tell the data source to commit its changes. And if you ask us to revert, I'll tell the data source to revert its changes. So let's try that, shall we? OK. So now when it comes up, you'll see that I've got save and revert buttons at the top. I'll mark these first thing, three things as delivered. You see there were no extra requests. When I hit save, at that point, the submit happens. So it will have synchronized those three changes at once in one request to the server. So if I hit reload, they will still be marked as delivered. And of course, I could make other changes. And then I could hit the revert button. And all my changes would be undone. And of course, it won't make a request to the server. OK, that's good. But right now, what if the user forgets to click the Save button? Well, that's going to be a bad situation for them, isn't it? So we'll try and make it much more obvious to them when they've got unsaved changes. I want to highlight things with a big, bright, brash yellow background if they've got unsaved changes. I can do that very straightforwardly by using uh, a bit another aspect of the CSS binding. So as well as toggling the delivered class, I want to also toggle a class called updated. And I want the updated class to be applied if this item is updated. And now you're probably thinking, where does that is updated come from? That's not on my model. And you're right, it's not on the model. It's added by Upshot only on the client. So while you're on the client, you've got access to that property, and that will tell you whether or not it's got unsaved changes. So you can vary the UI according to that. And again, just to show that everything stays in sync, I'll put the same, ooh, what did I just do? I'll put the same um, binding there on the other list of deliveries. So both of them shall highlight whether or not the thing is updated. OK, let's see if that works. So now I'll make a few changes, and you'll see that the big yellow bars start to appear in both lists so the user can see what they've not saved yet. And if we hit the Save button, the yellow bars go away because it's no longer got changes. Similarly, if I hit Revert, the bar will also go away. OK, so that's how Upshot is able to synchronize changes with the server. Very nice. Let me just show you another cool Upshot feature before we move on uh, to do with querying. Let's say the delivery drivers don't want to hear any information about stuff they've already delivered. They only want to see stuff that's not been delivered yet. So we want to filter delivered things out. I'm going to add another checkbox onto my UI to control whether or not we show things that have been delivered yet. So I will drop in uh, another checkbox into my UI here. And uh, this time, it says exclude delivered items. And I'll bind the check state of that checkbox to a property on my view model called exclude delivered. Now, that will allow us to know whether they want the delivered items or not. Um, but we have to create that property. So I'll go over to my view model, and I'm going to create this property. So self.excludeDelivered equals, and then I'm going to make it observable so that we'll be notified when it changes. And I'll say the initial state will be false, so the box starts unchecked, and we won't exclude anything. So go back into my user interface, and obviously forgot to press save there. Try again. OK, so I've got the exclude delivered items checkbox, and if I check it and uncheck it, nothing happens, because I didn't tell it to do anything yet. So what I want to do is be notified when they change the value of this view model property. So I am going to say, with that property exclude delivered, I want to subscribe to be notified when it changes. And when it does change, I'd like to have this callback function called please. And the parameter that gets passed into there will give us the current value. So I'll give it the name should exclude delivered. You could call it anything, but that'll do. And now all I have to do is tell Upshot to change its filtering criteria. So I will drop in a bit of uh, ready-made code here and reformat it so you can read it. So what I'm saying here is I'm setting up a filter rule that says if we should exclude delivered things, then my rule is that the property is delivered has to be equal to false. Okay? And if it, we're not excluding delivering, delivered, we won't have any filter rule at all. And then we'll tell Upshot to use that filter and refresh the data. Okay, let's try that. So now back in my UI, when I check the exclude delivered, you'll see that the delivered things vanish from the screen immediately. And in terms of what's happening on the network there, let's have a look. So uh, I've got my initial request to load the data. And now every time I toggle this box, you see it's going off to the server to refresh the query. So it's mapping that query all the way through the iQueryable into the underlying SQL database, which is good. But in this case, it seems a bit wasteful. Like, why do we talk to the server just to hide things? 
you know, we've already got all the data. Couldn't we just make the change on the client without talking to the server at all? Well, yes, because that's another really nice feature of Upshot, is that it can do queries locally as well as remotely. So to enable that, I'm going to create what's known as a local data source. I'll just drop in that code. So I've got another data source here called local data source, and it is a, no a local data source. And I'm saying that it fetches its underlying data from the real remote data source there. So that's where the real data comes from. And also, any time that underlying data changes, the local data sh source should change as well. So that's basically just a wrapper around the remote data source. And now, instead of displaying the data from remote data source, I'll display it from local data source. OK? So far, that will make no difference whatsoever, because I've just put a pointless wrapper around it, which does nothing. But the interesting bit is when I do the query, I can, instead of doing the query against the remote data source, I can do it against the local data source, like that. So now, when I toggle this checkbox, you see the behavior is still the same. But if we look at our list of network requests, we've got the initial one to load the initial data. And now as I toggle it, you see it's not talking to the server anymore. It's just making the change locally. So this is pushing us quite far towards this goal of single page applications, which is that the UI is rendered on the client. And as much as possible, we don't talk to the server, just to keep things really fast. OK, so we're getting somewhere with this. Right. Now, let's change the focus a little bit. We've looked at how we can create data, and we've looked at how we can create UI on top of that and do all the bindings and stuff. Now, when I send my delivery drivers out on the road, I'm probably not going to send them with a laptop. I'm probably going to send them with some kind of small mobile device. And so I want to make a proper mobile user interface for that. Now, what does that mean? Well, uh, the screen's going to be smaller. And I can't be having all these tiny, tiny checkboxes because the drivers have got these massive fingers and they can't press the little checkboxes. And um, also, because the screen are really small, they can't see too much information on it at once. So one, I want to change the styling to make it more finger friendly. And two, I need to change it so instead of being one big page, it's multiple small pages that you can navigate between. But when I say navigate between, I don't really want to actually talk to the server to fetch those pages. I want to you know, do the navigation on the client really quickly. So how can we build this? Well, let's start with making the UI look more mobile friendly. What you might have heard of already, or might not have, is that in MVC4, we've got this nice new feature called display modes. And that allows you to create an override of a view that applies to a specific type of device. So, if I want to take my index view that I've already created here, that we've been working on, excuse me, and I want to create a mobile version of that, I can do so quite easily. I'll copy that and I'll paste it in. And I'll change it so that this is called index.mobile.cshtml. And now the framework will use that for requests for mobiles. OK, so let's just delete all of that junk that I've typed in there. And I'll replace it with something a bit simpler just to get started with. OK, so again, I'm defining an upshot data context like before, and I'm using my view model like before. But the difference is that now my markup is just this trivial bit of static text, just so that we can see something's different. OK, let's try that. So in my browser, if I hit reload, uh, when it comes up, because I'm in a normal, web brow normal desktop browser, it's just going to look the same as before. But if I was on a mobile, and I'll tell my browser to pretend to be an iPhone here. Just, and all that's doing is changing the user agent string, OK? That's how we determine what's a mobile and what's not. So now we're sending the iPhone user agent string. We will get the mobile layout instead of the desktop one, OK? So that's a good start. But it's still not very good. I don't want all of this header around. That's a waste of screen space. I don't want the footer either. I don't even like the font. I want to change everything about how it looks. So I'm going to change the actual layout page as well. So. Uh, in my layout page here, if I could see the mouse, I will also do an override for the layout as well. So I'll copy the layout, and I'll call the layout layout.mobile. So now we'll use that for requests from mobiles. Okay. So what will we put in there? Well, again, I'm just going to delete all the junk I had in there, and I'll put in something very much more simple, just basic outline of an HTML page. Okay. Nothing interesting particularly. So let's see if that works. When I hit reload, Hopefully, it'll go down to a very, very basic minimal display now. Okay, So that's good. We're making better use of the screen space. But it's obviously horribly ugly now. So let's try and make it look slightly more attractive. I'll uh, bring in a bit of CSS that I've prepared that makes it look a bit mobile-ish. So I'll drop in my CSS file. Nothing clever about that. It's just CSS. And I'll also put in some markup for a little header bar at the top of the screen. So I'll say, 
deliveries just in a header bar. Okay, let's see how that looks then, shall we? So I'll hit reload and we'll see. Okay, it's looking a bit more mobile now. All right, now just to clarify, there's no magic here, there's no big framework. That is just CSS to give a red bar, no giant framework. All right, so I've got a basic kind of mobile appearance now. The other part of my problem, if you remember, is that I want to change the navigation mechanism. So instead of having one big page, I'm going to have lots of little pages that you can navigate around between. So how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to want to create some, client, some code to do client-side navigation, which means I'm going to have to add more code to my view model. And I'm quite keen on keeping my code clean. So rather than putting more and more code into this deliveries view model, um, and bear in mind that this is only code that applies to mobiles, I'm going to create a subclass of this that's just for mobiles. So I'm going to create a subclass called mobile deliveries view model, okay, which again is a constructor function. And then my basic bit of implementation for that is like this, just to get started. So if you know JavaScript, you'll know that this is one of numerous possible ways of doing inheritance in JavaScript. Um, I'm saying that my mobile deliveries view model constructor calls into the normal deliveries view model constructor. So any, any object that's derived from this function will have all the properties from deliveries view model and then some others that I add in here. So it's just one of various ways you can do inheritance in JavaScript. Okay, so what do I want to add here to do the client-side navigation? Well, I want to have some object that represents my position in the kind of navigation space. And I want to use the history.js library, okay, because we know that's got really good cross-browser compatibility. But one thing that history.js does not do particularly well is that it's, uh, it's got a very low-level API. So it just works with raw URL strings. And I want to work with something a bit more high-level than that. I want to define collections of parameters that can appear in the URL. And then I can have a nice high-level programming model for saying, what are the current values of those parameters? And I'd like to change the values of those parameters. OK. Now, I appreciate that may not be obvious. But hopefully, when you see the code, you'll see that it's not too bad. So. In order to get this higher level programming model, we've provided this very simple wrapper library called uh, NavJS. And NavJS gives us this nav history class. And that's based on history.js. And what it does is it allows us to declare parameters that can appear in the URL. So in this case, I'm al allowing the drivers to navigate between two different views, either a list of deliveries or a list of customers. So I've created a parameter called view, which is just an arbitrary string. And I'm saying initially they're going to be on the deliveries view. And then I'm telling this object to link itself to the URL, which means that when this view parameter changes, the URL should also change. And then if they press back, the URL will change. And then that should also change the view parameter as well. So in our view model, we can just respond to this view parameter. And that will be linked up with the, uh, the URL. OK, so just to check that we can actually see that on the screen, uh, let me go into my mobile uh, view there. And I'm just going to display the current value of that property, just so that we can see it changing. So I'm going to use another binding, and I'm going to say the current view parameter is, and then I'm grabbing my nav thing, I'm pulling out the current value of the params, and I'm displaying the view parameter. So that should initially start at deliveries, hopefully. And of course, instead of using deliveries view model, I also now want to use mobile deliveries view model for my mobile page. So let's try that. Come over here and hit reload. And so now you see the current view parameter is deliveries. Marvelous. Uh, but currently, I haven't got any way of allowing that parameter to change. So uh, instead of just having one link up at the top there, let's have a link, two links. I'll have a link to deliveries and a link to customers, uh, and that will change the view parameter. So on my layout page, which is here, I will change this nav header. So instead of having one item, it's going to have two. Deliveries and customers. And when you click deliveries, we'll call that function. When you click customers, we'll click that function. And you can put some arbitrary logic in your view model to control what happens when that happens. And my logic for what happens when you click those things is fairly straightforward. I just want to uh, change the value of the view parameter. So when you click on customers, I'm going to tell nav to change the view parameter to customers. And that will, in turn, change the URL. So let's try that, shall we? Back in my browser. I've now got customers link at the top there. And when I click on customers, you will see, if we zoom in, that the URL now has this parameter view equals customers. And if I click on deliveries, then the URL changes back. Now, you might think, why doesn't it say deliveries in the URL? Well, the reason is just that that's the default. So that's implicit. And whenever you're on the default values, we don't show them in the URL because you know that's just wasting space. So we're on deliveries there. And you'll see that the current parameter is deliveries. And if I click on customers, the current parameter is customers, and the URL also reflects that. So now I can click the back button, and I'll change the 
I have to zoom out here. So when I click the back button, I'm back on deliveries. When I click forwards button, I'm on customers. Back, forwards, back, forwards. OK, so we've linked up our um, user interface with the URL, and we can do a kind of virtual navigation without talking to the server. So all I have to do to finish this off now is um, actually change the markup that appears when you're on each of those two different views. So as a very trivial example, um, let's say I'll get rid of that content I was displaying for mobiles before, and I will paste in this uh, sort of fake example that says, uh, we use another binding here that says, if the current view parameter is deliveries, we'll show this markup, and if the current view parameter is customers, then we'll show this other markup. So hopefully the markup will change as we navigate, even though we're not talking to the server. So I hit reload. Now you see we've got show the list of deliveries. Then I go to customers, show the list of customers, and I can go back and forwards. And I can deep link as well. So I can take this URL, paste it into a new tab, click go, and we'll start off on customers there, just because that's what it says in the URL. OK, so we've got the basics of navigation. And I can finish my application fairly easily now, because instead of showing this dummy markup, all I have to do is really show the actual list of deliveries and in here the actual list of customers. And you've already seen me implement that once when I did it for desktop. I just use a bunch of bindings and it all works. So I could do that again now and it would take me about 10 minutes or maybe five minutes to do it manually, but it would be boring because you've already seen me do it once. And uh, I could use those 10 minutes to show you some cool new technologies instead. So I'm gonna cheat slightly and jump ahead to the point where my application is finished because it doesn't involve doing anything new. So in my source control system, which is Mercurial, I'm going to tell it to jump to the point where I finish my mobile UI. So update to there, discard all my changes. Don't worry if you don't know Mercurial. Anyway, back in Visual Studio, get it to reload the solution now, the updated one. And then if I show you what's in my view now, index.mobile, you see again I'm using these conditional bits of markup. Um, but now to display the deliveries list, I'm including the contents of a partial, similarly for customers. And I've also set up a way that you can navigate to a specific delivery. And the way I did that was that I added a further parameter into my nav history called delivery ID. And so when you click on a delivery, we'll take you to that delivery ID, and then we'll display that delivery details. So nothing new that you haven't already seen, just a bit boring to implement. So let's see that working now. And uh, obviously, I have to restart the server for that to work, or at least rebuild or something. Let's make it actually work now. So let's try it. When that comes up, then we should have our improved and finished mobile user interface. All being well. Is it going to work? I'm sure it will. OK, yep, here we go. So um, it's the same list of deliveries that you saw for the desktop one, and also the same list of customers that you saw for the desktop one, so grouped by customer there. The only thing uh, that's changed is, is that you can now navigate into a specific delivery um, just using the same techniques you've already seen. And I can mark something as delivered, and that will be synchronized with the server immediately via Upshot. So I can go back. I can change the filtering. I can do back-forward navigation. And we've pretty much got a nice little mobile application there. And so hopefully, that will actually look OK if I uh, you know, have a nice small screen. So uh, my drivers are going to be OK using that. OK, marvelous. So what's next then? Well, now we've got our uh, working mobile application with client-side navigation. What if we can make it work offline? Well, how is that going to be possible considering that this is a web application? Well, let's have a little architectural diagram. What you already know is that on the server, we've got these endpoints that return JSON data. And on the browser, we've got our application, which is all implemented with HTML and JavaScript. And the only way that our client-side code has to talk to the server while it's running is that it uses Upshot to make queries through to those data services. Now, what I didn't really emphasize so far is that when Upshot talks to the server, it does so using a provider. And a provider is an extensibility point in Upshot where you can control the sort of protocol for talking to the server. So there's a built-in one for talking to Web API, and there are other built-in ones, and you can put in different built-in ones if you want to talk to different servers. And we can use that to support offline access. Now, a little caveat here. The beta version of this product that you'll get this week does not include the offline piece that I'm about to show you because it's not completely production ready yet. We do want to ship the offline bit, and we can push that out through NuGet whenever it's ready, but you're not going to get it this week, OK? So this is a preview of future stuff. Right, so how are we going to make our application available offline? Firstly, how are we going to make the HTML and CSS available offline? Isn't that impossible? I mean, how's the 
uh, web browser going to make the request to the server to get it if there's no server it can reach? Well, it's not impossible. It's actually dead easy. As many of you will know, HTML5 has got this API called Cache Manifest or Application Cache. And basically, you just tell the browser a list of URLs that you want it to cache, and it will then make those available offline. So that's simple, problem solved, nothing to do. I'll show you how we do that. It's actually a very simple step. The more interesting bit is, how do we deal with uh, talking to the server to get data if there is no server? And what if the user tries to make changes to the data and we can't save that? What are we going to do? Well, how about we swap in an offline aware provider, which is like the normal provider, but it's a bit smarter and it's tolerant of the server not being reachable. And if the server's not reachable, then any time you try to make changes, it will store them locally using local storage, and then when the server is available, it will synchronize them back with the server. Okay, sounds interesting. The important thing to notice is that when this works, you don't have to make any changes to your application code. Your view models, your views, all that sort of stuff, no changes whatsoever. You can be completely agnostic to whether you're online or offline. That's one of the real beauties of the single page application architecture. So, shall we have a go at doing it? Right then. So I'm going to do it a bit backwards, actually. I'm going to start by using the offline provider, and then when we've got that working, I'll show you uh, how we can plug in the cache manifest. So. To uh, enable the offline provider, when I first configure my upshot context, as well as controlling buffer changes, I can also control the provider that we're using. And I'm going to use this uh, prototype called upshot.offline provider. Okay? So now it will be tolerant of the server not being there. But there's one more step I have to do, which is that I have to opt into this on a per data source basis. So in my data source, that is in my view model, uh, and I'm only going to do this for mobiles. I'm going to say, okay, upshot.offline provider, I would like you to be enabled for my data source. And what that means is the upshot um, offline provider will now start sort of injecting itself into that data source and interfere with the way it works so that if it can't reach the server, it will do stuff with local storage instead. Okay, let's try it, shall we? Um, actually, one further step before I do try it. Um, right now, even if this works, you won't be able to tell that it's working because it will just seem like magic. How is it working? Um, so I want to have some user interface that visibly shows when we've got offline uh, stuff going on. So that, in fact, that's good for the user because then they'll know that there are unsaved changes that they need to get you know, internet access again before they can save those changes to the server. So how can we know what unsaved changes there are? Well, it's easy because offline provider... Uh, exposes information about what changes it's not managed to synchronize yet. And I want to display those. So in this mobile view where I'm displaying all these conditional bits of markup, I will also display an additional bit of conditional markup. And I'll say, if offline provider has got a non-empty change count, then I want to display the output from a partial called sync info. And that's where I'll put the user interface for so saying that you've got unsaved changes. So let me create this sync info thing. I'll add a new view, call it sync info and I'll make it partial okay and then inside there I can put some markup to decide how I want that to appear so I'm just going to say with the offline provider I want to display the count of unsaved changes and I also want to display the last time that it tried to synchronize but failed and I'll also have a button you can click if you want to uh, retry the synchronization all right let's try it so back in my browser now when I hit reload it will all come up in the browser everything's happy and, um, of course, I can t change things, and my server is there, so everything's going to work okay. I'll mark everything as undelivered so we don't lose track of things. Now, imagine I'm offline. I'll simulate being offline by killing the web server. Okay? So I'm stopping IS Express. There's no web server anymore, so obviously there's no way my browser can talk to the web server. It doesn't exist. Uh, I can still navigate around, of course. I can still do the filtering, although it doesn't make that much. It sort of makes a difference now. Um, I can still navigate around and do stuff, but what's going to happen when I try to make a change to the data? Well, after a second or so, offline provider will realize that the server's not there, and so it will just start tracking the fact that we've got this one unsaved change. And if I go back, it's all nicely highlighted because we're using the updated thing to show uh, that it's been updated. And then the user can continue moving around, making more changes. Let's mark all of those Morton things as delivered. And you'll see now that we've got these three unsaved changes. Okay. So... Uh, my driver can start clicking on retry if they think they've got network connection. Of course, they haven't. The server's still not there, so it's going to just update that time to say we still haven't managed to synchronize since that time. Okay, so what if they get internet connection back? I'll bring my web server back up. Okay, and uh, then I will try clicking on retry. And what happens is that 
uh, when the web server fully wakes up again. Uh, you'll see that those thing, three things have been marked as delivered now, and the number of unsaved changes has vanished, and of course I can make more changes. So that worked pretty nicely. Um, but one thing that's not going to work right now is if my web server's not there, I can't even get to this page in the first place. At the moment, I'm okay because I'm already there, but if I wasn't there and I tried to reload it, then what's going to happen? Oh, the web page is not there. Boo. What are we going to do to fix that? Well, we're going to have to tell the browser that we want to cache those pages. And as I said before, we can do that very straightforwardly with HTML5 and the cache manifest. So let's have a go at doing that. It's quite easy. I'll just bring the server back up for a minute. And a cache manifest is basically just a list of the URLs that you want the browser to cache. And you can implement that literally as a text file if you want to. But I'm going to implement it as a razor page just so that I can inject some dynamic content. You'll see why in a minute. So I'll add a new item and I will make it uh, a razor page, NBC4 razor thing, and I'll call it cache manifest. Okay. And then inside my razor page there, I'm just going to dump in a bit of stuff I've already prepared. Don't worry about what that says right now. I'll show it to you in the browser. So uh, let's bring that up in the browser, shall we? So I'll go to this URL, cache manifest, and that will run the razor page that I just created and send this text file down to the browser. So a cache manifest is a text file that starts with the phrase cache manifest, and then it contains a list of all the URLs that you want the browser to cache. It also contains a bit of other configuration, like uh, if the user goes to a deep link um, and we haven't cached anything for that deep link, what are we going to do? Well, I'm saying that for everything that's under the root URL that's not mentioned above, we should use the contents that were at the root URL. So uh, uh, if I go to slash customers or whatever the URL was, that's going to bring up the home page, and then the client-side navigation will take us to the right location. Now, I don't want to do any fallback for the actual Web API endpoint. Uh, I don't want to pretend that Web API exists when it doesn't exist, because that would just confuse the offline provider. So I'm saying... If they try, when the browser tries to make requests to the, the data service, we should actually allow that to fail so the offline provider knows what's going on. And finally, I'm just injecting a timestamp that says when the application started up. And the reason for that is because um, I, I don't want to worry about people have, having cached old versions of my site. Uh, so if this timestamp changes every time my server restarts, that will force the browser to fetch a refreshed version of the site data. So let's try it, shall we? Go back to my home page first. And uh, that's not going to do anything specifically yet because I've not told the browser I want it to actually use my cache manifest. So let's start by telling it I do want to use that. And I will go into the, uh, the layout for uh, layout.mobile. And then on the uh, HTML tag, I'm just going to drop in this cache manifest. Okay? And then if I go back into my browser, when I hit reload, Hopefully, what we'll see, if I look in the console, you see all these application cache events that have occurred? So Chrome has realized that I want to cache all these files. And so it's gone off and fetched them all. And if you want more debugging information, you can go to, if you're using Chrome, you can go to this special app cache internals URL. And that shows us I've got a cache entry for this URL. And I can view all the files that it's cached there. So now Chrome has cached all that stuff. And other browsers support this too. I can hit reload. OK, that's fine. My server's there. And if my server's not there, kill the server again. This time, if I hit reload, it still comes up, even though there's no server. And even if I'm on a deep link, I can hit reload, and it will still come up with that thing that I asked for. And so I could go and, let's say I'll mark these other things as not delivered. OK, go back. And then my server comes back up later. OK, and now I'm going to hit the F5 button to reload. And I'm still not doing that, honestly. Um, this time, when it comes back up, you'll see we've still got those unserved changes, and then they synchronize immediately because the server's available. Right. So this is all great. I'd like to run this on an actual mobile device. So to test this out, I brought with me a generic, unspecified mobile tablet computing product with me. Um, <laughs> not sure what it is. It's made in China or something. And um, let's have a go at using that, shall we? Right then, so just last thing, before I switch on to that, if you are developing applications for iOS, for iPad or uh, iPhone, it's quite a good idea to stick in all these uh, meta tags into the header of your page. So what I'm doing here is I'm giving iOS the uh, URLs for splash screens for different devices, for an icon that can appear on the um, home screen. I'm telling it... Uh, that it's app capable. In other words, don't display the Safari Chrome around it. And I'm also telling it not to let the user do the pinchy zoom thing, because native applications don't usually, usually allow that for the entire screen. 
Okay, let's try it, shall we? Right. Let, this is the bit where we find out whether the projector and all the networking equipment is working and stuff. So um, let's see. If I switch over onto my uh, tablet computing product, um, I will try to load that. So I'll hit this bookmark. And if my web server is up, it is. Okay, so we've got to the page. All right, it's looking good. I can navigate over onto customers. I can do the nice sort of, uh, you know, flipping around thing. Got the nice uh, squirrely stuff. And I can go around. I can mark stuff as delivered and go back. And, of course, that's synchronized with the server. What if I'm offline? Okay, let's find out about that. So I'm going to go into airplane mode. All right. So I'm definitely not talking to the server now. Now, how do you do that? Thing. Yeah, there we go. Right, so um, I'm in airplane mode, okay, and um, I want to, uh, let's say I'll go back here, and I'll hit reload, and it still comes up. It's working okay. Now, what about if I want to make this feel like a native application? Okay, I'm going to come out of airplane mode, just because I don't know if it works when you're in it, and I'm going to go to add to home screen. So up it pops with its little icon. I can hit the add button. Okay, what's that going to do? Well, it's going to add an icon onto my home screen. Okay, I can go into there. I've got my splash screen. That seems to be working okay. Notice there's no browser Chrome around it now, so most people are going to regard this as the same as a native app. And uh, what if I'm offline? Okay, let's go offline again. Can I launch my application now I'm offline? Let's find out. Well, it knows I'm offline, but the application still comes up, no problem. Can still navigate around, can still make a few changes, like I'll mark all of these things as delivered again. So I've got these two unsaved changes. OK, I'll go out of the application, and I can then get access to my web server again when I get into network range. And I'll bring my application up again. And hopefully, I've still got those two unsaved changes. And if you were quick, you would have seen they just synchronized with the server. Sweet. Thank you. All right, let's finish this off. So um, last minute before I let you go, um, what have we just done? Well, we've looked at how single page application architecture allows us to build something that's as, nat as responsive as a native application and that it doesn't have to talk to the server to do navigation. And it can do things like working offline and so on. We didn't have to use any browser plugins, so it's going to work on any device. Very nice. And how did we do it? Well, we started by looking at data. We were using Web API to expose our data to the web in a very straightforward way. We used Upshot to consume it on the client, which gave us benefits like uh, being able to track changes and synchronize them, and also do local querying, things like that. We used Knockout so that we had a nice declarative UI programming model and kept everything in sync on the screen. Uh, we uh, used ASP.NET MVC4's display modes feature to create mobile versions of the UI. I didn't change the desktop UI in any way, so the desktop application would still work without any, uh, if I was on a desktop browser right now. And then we did some client-side navigation, which used History.js behind the scenes and the little nav history wrapper on top of that. And finally, we used the offline provider prototype to see how single-page application architecture lends itself very easily to working offline. So what do I propose you do with all this? Well, um, here are a few suggestions for what you could do. I suggest that you get hold of this code for this application that I just showed you. Um, I will publish that as soon as MVC4 beta is published, which hopefully is going to be later today. So. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, and I'll give you a download link. Also, check out these Upshot scenario samples that we're going to be publishing. And that will talk you through a whole set of other things you can do with Upshot, things like sorting and paging and stuff like that. Uh, hopefully, you'll like that programming model. Um, now, just to clarify, this is preview stuff. So you know, I don't know how it works in terms of go live or whatever. This is beta preview. But you know, hopefully, you'll have fun playing with that. And um, finally, if you want to learn more about Knockout, I'd recommend you go to this Learn Knockout JS website. That is production ready already. And um, that will take you through some interactive tutorials with kind of in browser coding step by step so you can get used to the MVVM and observable stuff. OK, so that is all. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll be around for a couple of minutes if you want to ask questions. Otherwise, enjoy your uh, geek night tonight and all the rest of the sessions. Yeah.